for now. And I grew up in a place where there is no snow. And one of the things I learned very quickly is that the schools will call a snow day, the colleges will call a snow day, but businesses will look out the window and like, what snow, right? So <laughs> I was like, okay, okay you know, um, it would have to be a hurricane for, um, for, for no one to show up. So I was saying that at least one person would show up. So thank you for, uh, for making the time to be here. So this morning we're going to talk about, um, and the title, you know, when I was thinking about it, I was like, it sounds a bit hokey. Shortcuts, because <laughs> well, like, there's no such thing as shortcuts. Should I call it shortcuts? And um, but in the end, I decided to do do that. And the whole idea is not that uh, there's no work involved with these strategies I'm going to share this morning. Is that they are a faster way of achieving your digital marketing goals. And two, most businesses are not implementing them. Uh, but I'll take you back a bit to how this journey. Began for me. Let me see if my my statistics show that. Um, actually, before before I do that, um, just so we we're all in the same frame of mind, all in the same space. I'd like to imagine you've been invited to to speak um, at a news um, a, a news station. Right. So you're an industry expert in whatever you do. And you say, hey, there's this thing happening in your sector. I would like you to come and share your expertise, your thoughts and ideas about it. And you're like, yeah, sure. And so you go on CNN, NPR, whatever it is, and they ask you some questions and you do a really good job. You nail it. And at the end, the anchor says, you know, you've provided so much value for our listeners today. I'd like to give you an opportunity to share a link or um, you know, a resource where people can find more information about this. What would be the very best link or resource that you could share that would get people to actually take action? I'd like you to sit with that question and at the end, who've done a good job, we'll be able to answer that question together. So back um, 20, three years now, the year 2000, uh, I'm in Zimbabwe at college and I've been playing around with some computers um, in different computer labs on campus. And I said, I'm going to start a web design company. I talked to a friend of mine, uh, Brian, that same day. And he's like, yeah, sure, I'm going to join you. So that was our first office right there. But we had a problem. We had no clients. And so we said, okay, we'll offer services for students from the campus where we'll like type out assignments. So back in those days, people would write handwrite assignments, and then you'd go to the lab and type, <laughs> type it out and submit a type assignment. So we'd type out the assignments for them, run CDs. So someone was like, you know, I've got all these 10 CDs and I want um, to do a compilation for my boyfriend or girlfriend can do that for me. So we were like, sure. So we started doing that on the side. So we decided to hustle to our side hustles. And we finally got our first client. And we were so excited about what the technology would be. Right? So, so we'd go in and do a presentation. Like, yeah, look, we've got this thing that zooms across the top. We've got this thing that's popping up there. And we very quickly learned that businesses don't care for that. Like, every business is thinking, yeah, how does this affect the bottom line? Like, how does this bring in more customers? How does this lead to more profit? And so um, here's a, a photo of me working on our very first client. And so I very, I very quickly learned that businesses are thinking about the bottom line and clients have got things that they want, that they are looking for. And if a business is not speaking to those things, it doesn't connect with, with those clients. So in order to provide a really good service as a web developer, I had to understand not just what the businesses wanted, but what their clients wanted. So I started really going deep into, you know, how do you figure this out? How do you, how do you connect all these dots? And as, as the years go on, the tools became, became easier to use. You know, a few years ago, if you wanted any sort of market intelligence, you had to pay a lot of money and it wasn't that current. But today, you can get a whole lot more for a whole lot less. 
And I'm going to go through eight different um, shortcuts or strategies, if you want to um, call them that, for how you can uh, reach your digital marketing goals more easily, find your clients, and you know, create a digital marketing campaign that actually delivers results. So the first one, and this seems uh, very obvious, is a guest list. Right. Uh, and if you're in business, you obviously know, that. okay, you, know, you start with the client pain points, right? So client wants something and you're offering it and you need to make the connection so they know, oh, this is the company to go to when I want this thing, right? So if you are a yoga studio and um, you, you offer a certain type of, of yoga or a certain type of, um, so you say you're specializing in of vinyasa yoga, for instance. Right. If you don't know that people are out there looking for that sort of yoga, you may be going out advertising everything else and you miss the point. Right? You miss the, the actual thing that people are looking for. So how do you find out what, what, are, what are my clients looking for and what is the actual language that they're using? And the reason this is important is because if I've got a client, for instance, who's an energy healer and on her website, she talks a lot about energy healing. And she found out that a lot of people were looking for Reiki, which doesn't mention Reiki on, on her website. And so she wasn't using the language, the specific language that her clients are using. So the number of tools that you can use in order to understand the exact language that your clients are using when they're going out to search. And I will go through um, one of these. So, Answer the public, answer Socrates, Uber suggest, Amazon uh, comments, and Quora. I'll do a little demo with answer the public, but I'm just gonna go over um, uh, all the different ones. So what these tools do, right? Uh, the top two, answer the public and answer Socrates, is they aggregate all the questions that people are going on to Google and asking. All the things that people, see that people are typing into Google when they're looking for something. So if you're a business owner and you're selling cars and you don't know what are people, when someone is looking for a family car, what are the exact words that they go into Google and type? If you, if you don't know that, then you, you produce content that is not speaking to what the market is looking for. And these websites help you understand exactly um, uh, what that is. People suggest that it does a similar thing, so very good for generating keywords. Amazon comments, the way Amazon uh, comments uh, research work, works is you say you sell TVs and you go onto Amazon and you look for the biggest retailers of TVs on Amazon. And then you scroll down to the comments and you see what are the questions that keep popping up, that people keep asking. Then when you develop your content, your ad copy, you're speaking specifically to those questions, answering those questions. And it's the same with, with Quora. We're just quickly going to um, uh, answer the public and show you how it works. Right, so, uh, anyone here want to volunteer and just mention something that you sell, a product that you provide, and then so we see if we can uh, get some questions that people are asking about that particular product. Uh, decaf coffee. Decaf coffee. So it's, it's do a search. And then what it will do, it will give us all the different permutations of keywords that people use when, um, when they're doing a search related to decal coding. So that's a bit uh, it's small. I'll, I'll read some of them out. Um, so is decal code brew a thing? <laughs> <laughs> Who drinks 
cold brew coffee. Who drinks tea coffee? Tea cold brew, whole foods. Can you get a cold brew tea Can you make tea cold brew? Right. So going through this, you can see exactly what people are thinking about when they are thinking about your product, and then you can create content that's tailored specifically to answer those questions. And if you go further down, it breaks it down into different. Um, so here are the prepositions that people use. Right. Can, um, without, to, near, deep coffee near me, deep coffee um, near a particular place, comparisons. And this tool is free, by the way. Right. So, um, what is this website? Uh, Answerthepublic.com. Okay, what is the uh, number 22, 22, 27, 37, 29, 29? What are those numbers? Also, uh, the, so those are the numbers of, so let's go back. So the numbers of, um, so 23 different questions that it's found, right? So the top questions that are being asked around that thing, uh, around that particular keyword that is found. So this is, so it's, 20, it's giving me 23 off 23. So sometimes it's, it's got, say, 600, but it's not going to list all of them. So say I'm, I'm, I'm showing you um, the top 50 off 600. Or right. So when the numbers are low, you'll get them all. Yeah. 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 Not, uh, yeah. You, you may not see all of them. Right. And it shows you the search volume, right? There. So how many people are looking for that um, in a particular month? And the cost per click, right? So there it's one dollar uh, twenty six, right? So the average cost per click for a keyword related to cold brew um, coffee. What that means is if you're going to go into Google and put ads, you would pay an average of a dollar twenty six. So you know that okay, if I go in and put um, if I bid at two dollars, I'm going to beat the average, and so my ad will show more than um, than what other people are doing. It gives you lists. I'm just really breaks it down. In, in different ways. So it's a really powerful um, research tool. And the second one is doing some um, research on what your, oh, by the way, if you've got any questions, um, feel free to ask them at any time. We will have uh, time for questions um, at the end as well. So you can ask them then too. So because of a lot of different tools that have popped up online, you can now see the exact strategies that your client, your competitors are, are employing, uh, what ads they're running, what keywords they are ranking for, uh, and what strategies they're implementing in their digital marketing campaigns. Right. Um, and there are some tools that you can um, use. Div.com, div it's basically a website where you put in a URL and it gives you information like, what sort of keywords does that website rank for? Um, what's, what's their domain authority? Domain authority is basically how, how important a website is seen to be when compared to, to other websites. And that's important because uh, when you get links from websites that are of a higher domain authority, it helps give your website a boost. Right? So going back to that, um, uh, that example of where you're being interviewed by a news station, if they put that link on their website and they are, say, if they are CNN, that's a very high domain authority link to your website. So it gives your website a much bigger boost Whereas if you got a link, say, from the Daily Hampshire Gazette, it's not as high in terms of domain authority, it's still a boost, but it's not seen as, um, as powerful as the link from CNN. So um, we look at Spike Food.
right? Once again, with Spine Food, there's a paid version, um, but this is uh, what we're going to do now is free. Right, so yeah, you can put in um, a, a URL uh, and see what um, what that your, what that company, what that business is doing in terms of marketing. So. Um, Do I have to carry to the chamber website and see what games? Okay. <coughs> it gives us a breakdown, and in the top there, four thousand one hundred sixty nine. So that's the number of keywords that this website ranks for on Google. And generally, the more keywords, the better. But not all keywords are created equal. Right? So, if you if you rank for, um, for example, St. Patrick's Day is it's coming, right? And people are thinking, okay, where, where can I go for a St. Patrick's, St. Patrick's Day celebration? If you rank for St. Patrick's Day celebration, say Springfield, that may be more valuable than ranking for uh, St. Patrick's Day two thousand and nine, two thousand eight, right? So. You know, the keyword, the power of the keyword is determined by how many people are looking for it and what it translate to, translates to in terms of commerce. Right? So people searching for um, uh, BMW, right? The keyword, like there may be 1,000 people searching for that and there are um, 50,000 people searching for cold brew coffee but the BMW keyword might be worth like maybe $100 per click because it translates to each sale of a BMW is just is worth so much more. And so the value of the keyword is not only how many people are looking for it, but what does it translate, translate to in terms of sales? So here we've got a number of keywords that um, the website ranks for. Then the estimated clicks, SEO clicks. So when people do the search on a search for amherstarea.com or a related term, and this website pops up on Google. How many people actually click through to the website? There is 5,310. So if you're looking at other businesses who are doing, um, running the same sort of services and products as you, it gives you an idea of you know, what the benchmark is. What are other people doing? So if you're getting um, 300 visits and you think, hey, I'm doing really well. You're like, what? You're getting 4,000? Okay, we've got, the market is so much bigger than I thought. There's so much more that we can do. Right? And also it uh, shows you how, how they performed over time. So of, the, of those keywords, 1,033 of them have, uh, it is, the website has moved up in terms of um, ranking over um, Whatever given time um, that is, right? In the competition, yeah. So these are websites that are ranking for the same keywords, right? And so it lists uh, all of those, and you can view um, all competitors. If you want to see more, you can do that. Then keywords. What keywords is this website sharing with the different um, websites that compete for the same keywords? And where are the intersections? So if, for instance, you are, uh, so say the, this was HVAC companies, right? And that's your business day, that's your competitor, that's your other competitor. You can see that, okay, you know, we've got a lot of work to do to rank for as many keywords as, as uh, this business here, but also the intersection, right? So if you look at, okay, what keywords uh, are similar and how can we do better for those keywords? Do we need to, to uh, produce more content around those keywords? Um, do we need to run ads so that we, uh, we catch people before they get to the organic um, results? And you know, Google lists, when you do a Google search, the ads appear at the top and then all the organic results. You, might think, you know what? Instead of competing with everyone on organic, we will run ads using these keywords that so will appear right at the top and we catch people before they go down to the um, the organic keywords. And then you can see the top pages. Uh, 
and you know give you some um, some recommendations for ads. And here, this is also it's really powerful. Right? It tells you if that business is running ads right? and have they run ads at all in the last. Uh, so here they've been they've been tracking more than seventeen years and they don't see any um, evidence of ads. So you you know okay my computer is not running ads. So if I run ads on Google, um, a step ahead. And there's just so much information. And this is the free version, right? So the, the, the paid version can go even deeper in terms of keywords, in terms of seeing, um, you know, so many sort of Facebook pages. Yes. Oh, this is um, based on who? This is like making the determination, well, this click's gonna be more valuable because of W or like how do you even know if that can be used to say when you're saying hundred dollars a click is one dollar. All right, so remember when we looked at um, answer the public, it showed you what um, the value of the keyword was. Right. So if you went to Google right now right, and you wanted to run an ad, right? So so you want to run an ad for, for this hotel. And uh, you go there and you're like, okay, I am going to do ads for St. Patrick's Day accommodation, for instance. You know, so you're coming into Westminster, St. Patrick's Day is a really cool place to stay. So when you go on there, you see what the recommended bid is. Right? And if you bid below that, basically you're saying that if um, another hotel is bidding higher, they're gonna, their ads are gonna appear more frequently and higher than mine. So, and I'm having doing that for whatever budget. Or you can bid above that and you say, okay, they're paying, what, $10 per click. I wanna pay $50 per click, right? So, all of a sudden, you're appearing higher than they are in ads. So that's what determines the value. It's basically how much are people prepared to pay for that click, right? So as a hotel, they may be prepared to pay $10 per click, $20 per click. Whereas a hairdresser might be like, you know, the average value, uh, the average uh, value per customer doesn't, um, uh, you know, merit me spending twenty dollars per click, and uh, hairdressers in the area won't be spending that much anyway. So you will find that depending on what industry you're in and what you're selling, some some keywords are just cheaper to, to buy than others. They're cheaper to rank for. I believe that answers. Any other questions? Then um, Facebook Ads Library, uh, I mean, anyone has ever used this Facebook Ads Library? Uh, and basically what it does, it, Facebook keeps, or gives, gives you access to a record of all the ads that it's running. So uh, how long the ad, the ad has been running when it first started running, how much it was paid uh, was paid for it. Uh, and we'll do a little quick little uh, demo of that. So it's suggested so doing a search for this is just to check. So so I just doing a search for HVAC with an um, mass. It's a bit the same, but no one is running. They can't find any of this problem. Tells. 
So, uh, this Hotel Boston. Uh, so it gives you a list of all the ads that are running that match the, the keyword. And you can see for each ad, And what you do, so right now I'm just putting keywords out of the air. You would be using keywords that you found during your search, ask the public, spy who, etc. So you would know that okay, these are keywords that businesses are actually using. Um, so we'll just pick any of these ads. Right? So it tells you uh, when the ad started um, running and when it's uh, when it stopped, um, the estimated audience size. So like with this ad here, it's one million. How much was spent? Less than a hundred dollars, and four thousand to four thousand and five thousand people saw it. Right. So if you if you do this research and you see that there's an ad that's been running for two months, then you know that the ad is working because if an ad is not working, businesses will pull it out quickly and replace another. One. So you know, okay, if we're doing an ad, this is a, a good uh, a good one to market. The next um, tip is about making use of every place where you get a free listing for your business or a paid listing, right? Really um, going all in on it. Uh, I'll give an example, a few examples of um, places where this happens. So for instance, the Google Business Profile. Google gives every business a free mini website, which is the Google Business Profile. And you can go into this profile and edit your hours, your services, your, your offers, your specials, your promotions. You can put daily updates if you wanted to in this, in this profile. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll show you an, ex uh, an example of uh, why this is so powerful. So when you just search, right? some people may never come to your website. So they go to Google, they just search. And on the right there, the business profile pops up. Right? And sometimes it's not even a search for your specific business. That could be a search for plumbing in Western Massachusetts. And it'll put a business profile there of what it thinks is the best business that matches that search. Now, the problem is a lot of businesses don't go in and optimize their business profiles. So as you can see here, you can put in your hours. It is closed because I think it's paid. I think it's not. Uh, I think it's pushed it. That. Okay, so you can put in a summary of what the business does. You can put in updates like this. So this could be specials and offers um, and photos. So you can add um, photos, all right? So you know how people can add, come to, so say you run a restaurant, people can come and take a photo and add it to Google Maps, right? But as the owner, you can also add your own photos, right? And the more recent the photos, the, the higher the likelihood you will rank above another business case. The more recent your updates, the more complete your profile, the better it is in terms of your, the likelihood that you will, uh, you will rank when, when someone does a search, right? That's a business uh, profile. And in February, Apple, uh, announced that it's starting its own competitor to business, uh, Google Business Profiles. So now you can go onto Apple and with Apple Business Connect, set up a profile, right? 
So you know how if you go to Apple Maps, a lot of businesses are already on there. But before you had no way of going into Apple Maps and say, hey, Apple Maps, this is not, um, these deals are no longer relevant. It's an up to date. Now you can. Now, Apple through Siri is a search engine, right? So it's a voice part search engine. People say, hey, you know, give me a plumber. Um, if you're a plumber and you've gone in and updated your Apple business uh, clinic profile and you put all your services on there, you've got photos, you've got hours, you've got how to contact me, this is your, your, your visibility and how you appear on Siri, how you appear on Google and Apple Maps, right? Business directories, wherever you can appear on a reputable business directory, do it. I spoke earlier about domain authority. The more places that you have linking to your website that have really good domain authority, the better. Chamber of Commerce um, um, websites, right? So I'll give Artist Dynamics my own business as an example. Artist Dynamics is a year old as a business. Right? If I want artistdynamics.com to rank at the same level as other web design companies that have been in business for years, it's going to take some time. And I get that. But I know that, hey, MS Area Chamber of Commerce, their website has got a high domain authority. And as a member, they give me a profile. So I go into that profile and optimize it. I put as much content as I can in that profile. All my services, photos, et cetera. And now if you go to Google and search web developer MS MA, Artist Dynamics on the first page, but not our website, our listing, the Amazon area website. They optimize for local. So a lot of times we're thinking, oh, we had people go, on, uh, go online and search. It's just so hard to compete because everyone is doing it. But all you really need to focus on is, I'm an electric contractor. There are 20 other businesses in this area that are offering the same services. How do I rank above them? I don't need to worry about the 100 other contractors in Hartford, the 1,000 other connectors in, you know, in another town. Like locally, who am I competing against and how do I make sure I rank above them? And that's become a really big thing for search agents because they realize that when people are doing a search for, hey, um, you know, find me a burger place, they want something local, they're not, oh, normally I don't think I'm offering to Boston to buy a burger, right? So the way you do that, optimize your the Google business profile, right? Make sure you, um, um, that's, uh, you put all the information in there, including your, your, your address. Apple Business Connect profile, any business directories that you can, um, that you can uh, get listed on. Uh, in the Chamber of Commerce um, website. And then another really popular thing is having location pages on your website. So say you've got a business that's in different locations. Right? Instead of just having just one contact us page, you have an actual specific location page for each location. So that would look something like, um, we've got a location in Holyoke. So you've got a page that says Holyoke, Massachusetts. So say you are um, abc.com, so you're your Holyoke, Massachusetts page would be abc.com forward slash Holyoke, Massachusetts. And then on that page, you talk about that particular location, what services are offered at that particular location, the address, the map, right? So Google map um, um, embed, a phone number. And if you want to say something else about the location and what in any other relevant information, you put it on there. Google loves that and other search engines as well. So Bing as well, uh, that sort of thing really helps you rank for, when someone does a search for um, this and that near me, right? So burgers near me, um, hairdressers near me, right? The location pages and optimizing for local, really big. And near me searches are huge. Right? So people do a lot of, like, I can't remember the exact percentage, but if you can really optimize for local, if people do a search for, a service or product near me it really boosts your, your rankings. Okay. Well, that's a question on location. So as a chamber, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go into Instagram and I want to tag someone business. Yeah. Say I'm at the business, but then the location's not coming up. If I click the address and the listing's not, you know, when it says where am I at, where there's a location, but it grabs, 
I'm always frustrated because I, it's a, a lot of times it happens with new businesses too. And like, I don't, I can't find them, like their, their address. I'm putting in their address, yeah. even the specific address. The business isn't coming up or oh, doesn't right. find it. Yeah. So does that mean they're not optimizing the Google? Like where's, do you know where Instagram is pulling that from? Because it looks like it's coming from like the Google map address, right? Yeah. So. As in, when you when you set up a new business, you can actually go even if you even if you're not the owner of the business, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go into a new burger place and you're like, oh, you're not doing maps, you can actually go to Google local guides and add them. Right? Mm -hmm. So the business can go in and do that and add themselves. But um, with the Google business profile, so what Google will do if you don't have the Google business profile that you create yourself, they'll create a business listing, right? That they just use put they create pulling. Any information they can find on your business from different locations, but that takes time, right? Mm -hmm. If you set up your business, you know, today that may not be months before, you know, and, you know and maybe months before you see that. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, so a business actually needs to go in and do that to expedite that process. It just makes it possible. Cool. Uh -huh. um, question for you, just to give you a little bit of context too. Say I'm a small business owner. I don't have a team under me. It's just me. I'm wearing a ton of hats. I find it really frustrating to have to update constantly all of these different avenues that we're supposed to be using. How important is it to constantly update those? Or does it make sense to just optimize it once and it's okay to sit there for six months if I can't get to it? Or does that end up ultimately hurting the, the search or the profile? Optimizing it once is 90% okay. of the work, right? Because as I said, for most businesses, I'm not even touching this and don't even go on this, right? So if you go in and optimize and say, okay, this is the information about my business that doesn't change um, from season to season to month to month, I'm just going to put that on the okay, make sure that it's optimized. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Just a quick piggyback on Claudius. Um, Instagram pulls from Facebook the location, and a lot of the times the locations won't turn up until people check in on Facebook multiple times. Mm -hmm. So that the new business might have to have a Facebook profile with that business address, and then people will have to have checked in on Facebook for it to appear on Instagram. Okay. All right. And it does take time. Yeah. Okay. Then we go to business profile optimization. Put a photograph in or photographs in. Recent photographs, that's when the public often to be less than the public higher. If it's a recent photo, is that the data when you post the photo or the metadata that's inside the photo when it's taken? So it's, that's more clear. Well, normally it's like the date when you post the photo, right? But it, it does, I mean, if you're posting a photo, say from like 10 years ago, the, 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 the the, whether it's Google or Facebook, or whatever, it, it reads the metadata and that affects it. So you want to be posting new photos regularly. But if you if you go in and you optimize the profile and you go photos from, of your business, say from last year that you put up, it's so much better than having, having none. Right. But all things being equal, metadata is posted. Yeah. So the metadata, so I think the way you look at it is if you went and posted, say, 100 photos in the whole from like six years ago, and you compare the winning posts like five photos and then like recent and current, those would do better than yeah. Thank you. Um, that's optimizing for local. Um, here's a, an, a, an example of a, another example of Google Business Profile. Um, uh, and what I want to show there is, you know, that no district could go in and just live with specials you know, go in and, and populate them um, on, 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 on the, uh, the, this type of file. I think uh, another shortcut is using other people's audiences. So when you're a small business or a new business, uh, there's just so much that, that you need to do before you even start thinking about marketing. And marketing is one of the first things you need to think about, but I need to get the customers right here. I need to serve them. And you need to build an audience, you need to do all these other things, but you can leverage other people's audiences. And uh, an example of that is me being here right now speaking. Right? If I was to do 
uh, workshop and say, hey, this is obviously an Amazon workshop. We're like, yeah, well, who are you? Right? But and the chamber has got an audience and they were like, hey, do you want to do this? Uh, this one? Like, yeah, sure. And so their website is talking about the workshop. Um, the, this, the, the social media is talking about the workshop. So artist dynamics is leveraging the, the, um, um, the chamber's audience, uh, the, audience chamber, the, the chamber's members um, and visibility. So uh, other places where you can leverage other people's audiences are podcasts. So what are the podcasts in your, uh, in your area? Maybe news programs where you can go and speak, blogs, right? So if you're an expert in um, the particular field, you could um, offer to do a guest post on a blog that has a ton of uh, visibility. People who run content platforms, whether it's a blog, whether it's a podcast, constantly looking for, for, uh, for people who, who, who they can interview, who can guest post as long as it's good value for their audiences. And, and someone even was, was talking about how they go onto Instagram and they look for accounts that have hundreds of thousands of, um, of, of followers. And they say, hey, you know, could I create some posts for you? All you have to do is tag me, right? Because they know if you are a high visibility profile on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, one of your biggest challenges is creating enough content to keep your platform going. So you say, hey, I'll create a week of content for you. You don't have to pay me. I just need you to tag me. And it's be content that's in line with exactly what you're doing. And they just say, oh, sure. And then they, they, they tag you, you know, at courtesy of whatever your hand is. That's other people's audiences. They partner websites, right? So whenever there's an opportunity for you to partner with another organization, uh, instead of it ending with the physical, see if there's an opportunity for them to have a link from their website to yours, right? Because once again, you're just building that online um, on their visibility uh, for that one. All right. Then the other thing that as, uh, as businesses we struggle with is how do you, when someone comes to your website and they're not yet ready to buy this. Sorry, so just back up on blogs. Yeah. Do you think it would be more valuable to be writing your own blog, just publishing, or trying to get on higher websites? And to get on our regular websites. Because uh, if you, um, you could run a, a hundred blog posts and not get any, any readers for them, right? Um, what it is, that, I think it's that 90% of all content that's put out on the internet is not even ranked, right? So it doesn't even appear in post search, they, they, they never see it. So if you could do one blog post that that gets published on a high visibility, high traffic website, and is going to drive traffic to your website, it's so much better than doing 10 of your own that don't get any visibility. And that link stays on there forever. So most people, when they publish a blog and link to your website, that link is there you know, forever. So when, when people are thinking of, buying something or you know, in, you know, investing in an experience, sometimes to start thinking about it months before they're ready to buy. They'll come to your website and they're like, oh wow, this is cool. Um, I'll, I'll come back and then they never come back. How do you take advantage of all the people who are interested in your product and service but not yet ready to buy? And so there's this stat that's thrown around that in any market, in time, only 3% of people are ready to buy. So if you're gonna have, say, 100 people um, get swimming pools uh, constructed this year in, say, New Hampton, right now, today, three people woke up saying, okay, I need to find you know, a, a, a company that can do this for me. Right? So if those, if those 97 came to your website and are not ready, just doing initial um, research, how do you get them into your ecosystem? Uh, and I pulled that train love for the 97 to 97%. So one, um, one way is retargeting. Uh, so different platforms, ways of doing so, for instance, on Facebook, you get a bit of code, it's called a Facebook pixel, put it on your website. When uh, someone visits the website, 
and then it goes off um, you know, onto website, uh, onto Facebook or Instagram. Boom, they see an ad from you. They're like, oh, wow, I was just on their website this morning. So amazing, right? So that's, uh, that's retargeting. Uh, lead magnets. Yeah. So going back to the swimming pool example, you could have a PDF on your website. This is how to make a decision about which swimming pool, what sort of swimming pool to get. Right? I said, oh, that's cool. I'm going to download this. They click on the link. They have to put in the email address, right, to, get, to download it. And so now you've got the email address, and then you run them through a nurture sequence of emails where basically you go <coughs> something, hey, thank you so much for uh, downloading our PDF. Uh, my name is so-and-so. I'm the owner of the company. If you have any questions, don't, don't hesitate to, to, uh, to reach out. Then a week or two later, um, you know, this is you hear some trending designs for swimming pools, just in case you know you're interested. A few weeks later, um, this is something else. You know, hey, lighting for swimming pools. This is the new thing, whatever. So you just you're nurturing them. You know they're interested, and you're keeping them top of mind. And then another thing is low ticket offers. So someone is interested in, hey, I really want to um, uh, join a gym, right? So the gym is hundred dollars uh, a month. And then you say, hey, you know, every month on the first of the month, um, our top trainers will do a, do a session for um, anyone who's interested in testing it out for just $10. Someone's like, okay, cool, I'll, I'll, I'll sign up for that. Uh, and then I've got two more points. Let's go, let's check the time, six. Two more points, and I'll go through this quickly. Um, so one is accessibility. Right, so uh, at least twenty percent of of uh, people who use the internet have got some sort of disability uh, that prevents them from accessing the internet the way most people can. So this could be visual impairment or some sort of cognitive um, condition like epilepsy, um, ADHD, and uh, according to the Americans with Disability Act, businesses <laughs> need to make um, provisions for people with disabilities. And there actually have been lawsuits where businesses have been sued for not having accessible websites. Uh, and the way you do this is so a good place to start is to get an accessibility audit and design websites with, websites with accessibility in mind, um, add accessibility features to, I'll, I'll not show you because you know, when you say accessibility features, for like, what does that mean? So I'll just show you. Um, Right. So, for example, uh, this is the Artist Dynamics website. There's this little uh, icon, and you, this is the normal icon for accessibility. So, most sites that have accessibility features, the Amherst Area Chamber has got this on their site. If you click on that, it shows you different things that you can do, right? So, see, just say profile. Uh, so, when you've got bright, flashing things on your website, sometimes I can, um, you know, uh, uh, prompt. Uh, People are going to seizures to have a seizure, so they can put that on. So you can go on. See, it's it dulls the the, the bright, it reduces the contrast immediately. Um, so someone can browse your website without um, a more comfortably uh, vision impaired profile. But so you just see zoom zooms in, and there are other um, uh, things that you can. And settings that you can change. So here you can, you know, if you get trouble focusing, right? So this just puts that bar on there, and so you can just scroll through and very easily um, um, follow what's happening on the website. And there's just so many different you can go through. Uh, uh, just you can change colors, change size of font. Um, connect to a screen reader so people who are blind have a screen reader um, reading our text for them. So it just makes your website much more um, accessible to people with different um, uh, uh, disabilities. Okay, is there a tool or a service that you can just add to your website that will automate all of that for you? Yeah, there, there is. So uh, there's a service that we offer, we, we partner with the, uh, an AI. Um, accessibility provider for accessibility. But yeah, there are a, a number of them. There's UserWay, there's Audio Eye, um, and, and a number of others.
why would it be the business's responsibility to give now you find glass or a cane to somebody with a disability when there are apps that they would have that do this their site or somehow not as able? Yeah, so in the losses that have been um, filed, right, and the thousands of them now, right? So, and from big businesses like Target, uh, institutions like Harvard um, have had to settle. The way the, uh, the Disabilities Act explains that businesses have to make provisions for disabilities. So, if someone is coming into a business, there has to be a ramp, right? There has to be wheelchair access. And it's the same with your website because it's a point of contact for your business with the public. So you have to make provisions for disabled people on, uh, on your website. So what's the difference between having a ramp or keeping them a wheelchair? Like it feels like the glasses that you provide is an extra step, that they would have their own glasses yeah. or their own app or do that. I don't understand like the definition of what you know the ramp yeah. Yeah. So I think um, what what you do, what you're doing, right? For instance, with people who are with a visual, uh, uh, visually impaired, is they put a screen reader, so they already have a tool. Yeah. But the screen reader cannot does not work well with all websites. Sometimes the websites don't optimize the screen reader, so it's it's hard for them to use to even use that tool they have. Right? Um, with things like um, the contrast and bright uh, uh, features on a website, someone may not have um, may not may not have the glasses you know, that makes that that makes it possible for them to look at your website without um, without it triggering that condition. So I don't know. Um, I think we need a, a legal. I just know that you know the way the lawsuits have gone. Is most businesses are advised to settle because you're not going to win this. Yeah. Yeah. And Harvard gets sued because they have money. Yeah, they have a lot of money and Target as well, right? So, yeah. There's actually a, a bunch of lawyers that have just gone, they've made it their thing, like, oh, wow, this, this is easy. So, they've just been going after, yeah. after the business. But small businesses have a target. Too. Yeah, small businesses have a target. We are part of uh, our chain, our website is powered by Chamber Master, it's a business that powers Chamber. Websites, you know, website is our website, it's our event module, you know, it's all in, all in one. And our newest website version now implies the thing, which our, our old one didn't, and it was actually able to discuss upgrade as well because we were able to learn maybe a client. And we were getting all kinds of email, and you will get it as a small business. So I am going to put it as a reminder, but one of the other resources are out for businesses, but it's, we knew that it was something that was. <laughs> I wonder if, like, healthcare, that's something you could offer to members that would be a benefit of chamber membership. That's pretty special and unheard of for me. The, the IRS does give you a, a tax a rebate that, uh, in some uh, So the first $200 is not eligible, but then 50% of any expenses above that up to $10,000. Plus, if you have a special that we have on the website, that's and you haven't made it accessible to some of the target right there, they're not able to do that. Yeah. It also is important because if you know your target group is 40 plus, you know, <laughs> depending on you know, who, who is your target group, you know, reading, right? You know, mm -hmm. I, I swear I would never be one of those people who reads. I've got them everywhere. It's, it's life, right? It happens. So. That's your target. It's going to happen. There's another question there for you. Um, I heard it was on a screen actually Google. Yeah, Google started to uh, to use that. Yeah. So if you've got if you've got accessibility features on your website, accessibility, speed, um, HTTP so SSL layer. So you know, on some websites, it's HTTP and HTTPS. That means yes. that it's a secure connection with the server, all those features just help you rank and find You get a warning that says the site 
So um, very quick, but yeah, I'll go to the um, last one, which is AI. Um, I was going to uh, do some um, demos with some of these, but um, so chat GPT, most of us have heard about, about it. So you can go in and say, hey, give me some really hard hitting books for a hairdressing salon, and it can do all of them. And the powerful thing with ChatGPT is that you can actually have a conversation like, yeah, I, I don't like this. Can you optimize these for um, teenagers? For, you know, and you just then give it more. Uh, so what's happening now is it's not so much that these AI tools are out there, but how do you, uh, how do you use them? So for instance, with ChatGPT, there's a big market right now for prompts, ChatGPT prompt, right? So we've got this all-knowing thing, all-knowing, right? So the thing is, what questions do you ask it to get the best results? So you can buy whole stacks of chat GPT prompts that help you really do, whether it's marketing, whether it's writing college essays, whatever it is. Uh, in the software like Marketing Blocks, where uh, it's Marketing Blocks that AI, I think that's awesome. You put in a few keywords, like um, hairdressing salon, and it creates, and you press go, creates, Ads for you it creates um, that you create sample blogs, sample social media posts, simple, right? all from one click. So uh, you don't have to go in and do everything, you know, one by one. Um, Chat Sonic, which is uh, like Chat GPT, but it's connected to Google. And so uh, Chat GPT has got a data set that it's work that it uses, which is up to two thousand. 20, so it's, it's not current, whereas with Catonic, it's connected to Google. So when you're doing your research, it's real time. Um, and if you're doing YouTube advertising, you notice that now YouTube is really pushing um, AI. So before, with your targeting, you could, um, and you still can go do a lot of very specific targeting. Now it says, hey, do you want us to show this ad? only to people who would what, you know, click or buy or whatever, right? So you're letting uh, the algorithm decide not only um, who are the people who uh, would use your service, but who are the people who would actually act, would actually do a, you know, uh, a certain kind of action. Then A-B testing tools, so for instance, um, some mailing list uh, platforms right now, you can test different uh, subject lines. So it will send 300 emails with one subject line, the next 300 with a different subject line, see which one performs better, and then use that one for the rest. All right, and uh, those are all the ones that I have for today. They're, they're more shortcuts, and um, we're very happy to send you uh, PDF with. Uh, all, with all of these and um, the others that I have, if you just send an email to hello at artistdynamics.com, um, I, I can, uh, I'll send that to you. So before we do quick uh, our Q and A, just going back to the example at the beginning. So the anchor said, "Hey, thank you so much. You've given us so much value. I'm going to give you an opportunity to to put in a plug." And so you know. Give us a link. What would be the best knowing, you know, given all the things that we've done through this morning, what would be the best, what would be the best place to send it? And before we answer this, uh, I need to know Brendan Bashar, this is a high, high performance coach. And he talks about how if you were an author and had written a book, there was a time when you'd appear on Great Long America, say, hey, this is my new book and you get 20, 30,000 sales just off that one appearance. But now it's just, it's just gone right down and people are struggling to sell 2,000, 3,000 from appearances like that. And so, so it's kind of that discussion. What do you say to get people to actually say, oh, what? I want to try that. I want to act. I'm going to use this link. You. What's the link that I would give the, what I would do if I was on NBC, yeah. I would say my link is ashcorporate.com forward slash NBC. And then I would have a, there would be the blog post specific to the content that I talked about on that specific show. 
question and then ask NBC to link to that page. Exactly, right? That, that sums it up very, very well. So you've done your research beforehand and you know that people who listen to this show, this is what they're interested in. Right? And I'm going to prepare content specifically for them. And it could be content that you already have, right? You just customize it for that audience. And so when they say, hey, so what, what would you like to share? Instead of saying, well, go to my website, um, abc.com, say, you know, the stuff that I shared this morning is just a fraction of what, you know, what I would love to talk about. I've got a whole lot more. And uh, this is the address. And if people go there, there is an extra bonus or whatever. So you, you make it really, really uh, tempting and valuable for the audience. So for example, um, right now, I didn't say, hey, this is my website. I was like, hey, I've got more shortcuts. Please, you know, um, um, you know if you want more, uh, email me. And that has been shown to just shoot up the, the response rates because people, are, people get bombarded with links and click here and whatever. And so they're thinking, okay, you know what? Is this really valuable for me? Do I want to do this? And when you can show them the value, they will click. So when, you, when, you, when you're out advertising your website, don't, don't give people your homepage. Give people a link specifically that answers their particular, um, or that speaks to their particular issue or problem that they're looking So back to my, my customer that I spoke about with that Reiki, uh, which is, I am talking to her with Reiki, she would direct them to the page on her website that's specific to that particular service. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a few minutes for, Questions? Yes, you said you, you want to leave. So yeah. Much. I have something very specific to look it up. Now, but we have a, a building in that has a, a, a new street, not only the street address, but the street, down the street. Um, the prior address for where this building was was Organic Road. And now this street address is one University Drive South. So University Drive South didn't exist until this building was built. Who owns the database that autofills uh, addresses? So I've gone into Google and I blocked a pin. It would not allow me to use the number, the numeral one. I can use O N E. But when someone goes to Amazon and wants to have something shipped to them, the address doesn't exist. It exists in the town. It exists with the post office. Um, in the beginning, when we opened the building, everything was being dropped off at the stadium because that is one university <laughs> drive. <laughs> We're on one university drive south, totally at the other end of the street. Do you know, but like, is there such a thing? I mean, there's, there is such a thing. Who owns it? I have tagged it. I've even gotten thank you from Google. You know, the road exists, but we used to think it was Snell Street, and it's not. Snell Street doesn't start until we get out. Of it. So circle that one. So this this location used to be four ninety seven North Lincoln Road, and it, it appears on the USPS database. It does. <laughs> it's always good to have a stuff for talk. Yeah. yeah. How long has it been? Uh, we opened in September. Okay. Because I, I went through a similar thing, not with a different street, but with a completely new, and I had to apply with the town. This was in Belgium town. And once the post office start, agrees that this is the new thing and they send mail there, then, then it takes three to six months for everything else to sort of catch up to it. But from my understanding, it was the post office sort of runs yeah. the legal addresses of things. Maybe they just have it updated. Yeah. Maybe you should call the back. Right? Yeah, with the town. Because I know that I had to like submit a like a letter to the town post office. Yeah. Like the yeah. yeah. So that's why people are although now you you know all the drivers know. <laughs> but in the beginning, it's like Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> Boxes and delivering them to the because they all Thank you. Any 
So we did, just so everybody knows too, we have recorded this. So I will send it to you all so you'll have the, the presentation and hopefully your words as well. <laughs> um, last minute entries, anybody? Business cards? Oh, I see a taker. <laughs> sure. Yeah. What's that? It is, but not if you want to go to LLB and buy something. Oh, it's so strange. It's so weird. No, no, no. It's, I mean, Amazon doesn't pick it up. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm wondering if Amazon. Well, that's just it. Who feeds that international? I mean, there's got to be something. Probably right. They don't, they don't need to want, but it's yeah, an interesting. You know, it shows up. It shows Probably up because not. I was able to get it. To Google Maps sees it. But when you figure it out, let me know. I'm sure I'll, you're not I'll the only one. Yeah, I'm sure okay. you're not the only one with that problem. There's new streets all the time. Um, would you like to do the honors? We have two gift cards just for downtown Amherst. We have a twenty-five dollar and a fifty dollar. We'll do the twenty-five dollar first. We build up. Uh. Shona was. <laughs> yeah, no problem. And then fifty dollars. Tim O'Brien. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's it. Yes. That's it for the day. Yes. Feel free to hang out. We have lots of snacks and coffee, and that's it. Next month meet. is our after five April twelfth. It's going to be the tour. The registration should open by the end of the week. Um, I want to thank Heather for thank stepping you. in. I know <laughs> you nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> right. no problem. Thank you so much. It's awesome to have you and your expertise. I know a lot of people will benefit from our shows. We do have a YouTube channel. We'll post it on there as well. So you'll get you'll get a central link. We'll also post it to the YouTube channel as well. So hopefully you'll get more of that. <laughs> We'll build it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Yes. Had a lot of snow day. Everyone's like, I gotta go pick up the kids. Kids had to lay over. Kids.